Hi, everyone. Congratulations again to all the State Bar Gavel Award winners. Y'all are doing amazing work, and we really appreciate all you do. My name is Laura Prather, and I'm here tonight, or today, uh, to announce the James Madison Award winner. But before I do that, I wanted to recognize some of the distinguished members of our audience here today. We've got Lieutenant Governor Bill Hobby here, former Governor Mark White, Texas Ethics Commissioner Chairman Paul Hobby, Dean John Beckworth and his wife Laura, former Senator Bill Haley, former Senator Babe Schwartz, Representative Sarah Davis, Chairman Todd Hunter, and Sandy Edwards, the Regional Director of the U.S. Senator John Cornyn's office. Thank you all for being here, and I hope I didn't leave anyone out. Um, we are very honored to have you here. So now for the James Madison Award winner. This year, the award goes to someone who means a tremendous amount to me personally and professionally. It's former Senator Don Adams. He has spent the better part of more than four decades working to protect the public's right to know and upholding liberties of the First Amendment. He's a native of Jasper, and I'll come back to that later when we talk about East Texas, where he developed an early appreciation of the law. At five years old, Don's grandfather, who was a district judge there, used to take him to the courtroom to watch his father, who was the district attorney, give his oral arguments. This started at a very early stage, and it led him to, get, to graduate from Baylor Law School. In 1968, he was elected to the House of Representatives, and then he moved to the Senate, where he served until 1977. While he was in the legislature, he was involved in writing and passing the original Open Records and Open Meetings Act. And you know, it's interesting being here this morning and hearing the presentations um, that went on. Don was at the forefront of everything that we've talked about today. He was original author and supporter of open records and open meetings, but he also worked to reform state ethics after the Sharpstown scandal in the early 70s. His efforts began the legislative reform, including public disclosure of campaign contributions, requiring lobbyists to register their activities, requiring public meetings to be open for inspection. These are all things that we just, at this point in time, sort of take for granted, but it had to start somewhere, and it started in large part with this man right here that we're honoring today. He was chief legal counsel to Governor Dolph Briscoe. He led the campaigns, many campaigns, for Lieutenant Governor Hobby, and he has touched so many lives of people that are here in the audience today. What's amazing to me most is that this passion that he has for transparency, accountability, and free speech hasn't slowed down in what he calls his retirement. I met Don in 1998, and we've had the pleasure of doing work together for the last 17 years. We met volunteering for an organization that did legislative work, and since that time, Don and I have had the pleasure of having a role in passing a number of different laws Don, in particular, has been instrumental in the passage of five of the most significant pieces of First Amendment transparency and whistleblower legislation in the last decade, and this is during retirement. He has been instrumental in getting the Free Flow of Information Act passed, the Citizens Participation Act, the Defamation Mitigation Act, electronic communications being open to the public under the Public Information Act, and the defense of accurate reporting on third-party allegations about matters of public concern. That's, that's a, a lifetime of achievement right there in retirement. He's amazing. Personally, I'll go back to the East Texas part now. I, I can attribute my, in large part, the marriage to my husband, to Don Adams. Um, when Don and I would sit there at the Capitol and he would teach me the ropes, and I'm still learning every day, believe me, he would 
tell me all these East Texasisms, and to me, it was like a foreign language. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? And so, one of them was, you know, Laura, you got to learn to keep your powder dry. I was like, okay, what does keep your powder dry mean? But instead of asking Don, because I didn't want to look stupid, um, I called Fred Hartman, who was somebody that we had worked with at the Texas Press Association and who was a fellow East Texas person. And I'd say, Fred, Don just told me this, keep your powder dry. I don't know what he's talking about. What does that mean? And he would translate for me all the East Texasisms, and that grew into an excuse um, to call Fred every time Don said something, and now we're married. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, Don, for that. Um, <laughs> but thank you most of all for your passion for the cause. The debt that Texas citizens owe to Don Adams is absolutely immeasurable. The generous giving of his time and his talents to all of our causes just cannot possibly be, be re repaid, but we're gonna give you an award today. <laughs> so, Don Adams, we are pleased and proud to bestow upon you the James Madison Award for 2015. Please come receive your honor. Golly, <clears throat> wish my mama could have been here to hear that. <laughs> Governor White, Governor Hobby, uh, Representative Davis, Representative Hunter, where are you, Todd? Todd, you're here? I didn't think Todd would miss a meal. This is a singular honor for me. <clears throat> I'll have to tell you that, that this honor has to be shared. It has to be shared with Laura Prather and Donis Baggett and Alicia. Is, is Ben Sergeant in the room? Ben? Well, though, I know you all know who Ben Sergeant is. This would make a perfect Ben Sargent cartoon. Laura Prather on a white stallion <clears throat> with, a, with the sword of St. John in one hand and the First Amendment in the other hand, charging the legislature as it is depicted by Ben Sargent. Donis Baggett on a black stallion <clears throat> with the First Amendment in his hand and me holding on to Laura's coattails trying to keep up. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> the, the, the landscape of defamation law in this state over the last eight years has been changed dramatically, mostly due to Laura Prather. I keep telling her, Laura, I am 77 years old. I cannot do this. And, oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, Governor White, that, uh, and Francis I. Gandy's here. I love Francis I. Gandy. There he is back there. He's from Corpus Christi. <clears throat> he and Mark and I were in law school together, and uh, in Baylor together, and that was before the current president, who we will not mention. And, and uh, the, you like that? <laughs> and I have a lot of stories about Mark White that I'm, I won't tell. <laughs> and Francis was there. 
I want to tell you that, of course, being raised in the family that I was raised in, it was a family of lawyers and a family of people that were in public service, judges, members of the House, members of the Senate, uh, district attorneys. They had a unusual appreciation for the first, four, fifth, sixth, and fourteenth amendments to the Constitution of the United States. They lived them. They applied them. They were very sensitive about transparency in government because they knew, and I learned this at their feet, they knew that left to its own devices, government would run off the track. It took, it took the tension that the First Amendment creates in the freedom of the press between the press and the government to keep the government on track. It takes the transparency that is so necessary for average citizens of this state to keep the government on track. I ran for the House of Representatives in 1968. I didn't, I'd never been, I'd never seen the House of Representatives in session. I never aspired to be a member of the House. I aspired to be the district attorney of Jasper County, just like my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather were. The district attorney resigned and I thought, you know, this is my chance to be district attorney. And I went all over that district and I got letters from the leading citizens of that, of that first judicial district, to John, John Conley to appoint me district attorney. He got a letter from one man in Jasper that was a lobbyist for the timber interest, wanting him to appoint someone else, and he did. <laughs> so I thought to myself, my naive little Jasper boy self, I'll just run for the house and give him hell. <laughs> so I did. I ran for the house. And you know what that sorry son of a gun did? He didn't run for re-election. <laughs> I didn't get to give him hell about anything. Well, <clears throat> when I got to the House of Representatives, and you, you picture this. A kid from Jasper, Texas, you know, I'd tried lawsuits. Actually, litigation was what I loved, and that came from my love of Judge Frank Wilson, Mark, <laughs> who was a taught practice court in Baylor. And uh, so, but, Jasper is not a cosmopolitan area. <laughs> I'm sure that there are many of you out there that cannot believe that, but trust me, it's not cosmopolitan. And here I was sitting on the floor of the House of Representatives. I would lean back in my chair and I would look up at that beautiful ceiling and I'd say, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> well, Believe me, I was so green I wouldn't burn. You could not set me on fire. <laughs> but John Conley had appointed a select committee to review and revise public education in Texas. And I'm sure they did good work. I never did get to see any of it, but I'm sure they did good work. The superintendent of schools at Coons Independent School District called me on the phone and he said, Don, he was a good friend of mine. He said, Don, they have, they have extrapolated the value of the Coons Independent School District based on several pieces of property that they looked at. And he said, it's way out of line. He said, would you please get me a copy of the parcels of land that they used? And I said, sure. 
I wish uh, Glenn Ivy. That's his name. I, it's burned into my brain. So I called Glenn Ivy, who was the director of that uh, outfit, and I said, uh, "Mr. Ivy, this is Don Adams." Who? I said, Don Adams, who are you? I said, well, I'm a member of the House. Oh. I said, Mr. Ivey, I'd like to have the list of properties in Coons Independent School District that you use to project the value of Coons Independent School District. And he said, you can't have that. I, I, I thought, what? <clears throat> I realized I'm from Jasper. <laughs> <laughs> and I realize I'm only 28 years old, but I've got to vote on that bill. I said, Mr. Ivey, you didn't understand me, I don't think. I'm Don Adams, I'm a member of the House of Representatives, and I have to vote on the proposal that you're going to make to revise public education in this state. I heard who you were. I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> so I sat down at my desk, Governor Hobby, and I wrote a press release that would have taken the hair off of a feral hog. <laughs> <clears throat> and I issued that press release. And Felton West, who wrote for the Post, put it in the Post. I think that's the only newspaper that got it. <laughs> Felton just didn't have much to write about that, but I guess. You had to know Felton. Felton, was, Felton had a burr haircut, and he, if you pulled his collar back, it would just be nothing but red back there on his neck. <laughs> but he was a good man, and he worked for Governor Hobby, and he was a good journalist. And so, you know, I thought to myself, there's something wrong about this that that even a an elected official that had to make a judgment about a piece of legislation was not able to get the details. Well, that was the genesis of the Open Records and Open Meetings Act. So fast forward now, and I'm in the Senate, and Governor Bill Hobby was absolutely, let me tell you, absolutely, A, my best friend, and B, was the finest lieutenant governor that ever served in this state. <laughs> and being a journalist, he understood open meetings and open records. And let me assure you that I could have never passed those bills had Bill Hobby not been lieutenant governor, but he was, and I did. One little quick story. I was sitting at my desk in my office, and I hope you journalists will appreciate this. And Sissy Austin from Jacksonville, Texas. Now, you know, most women in East Texas are named Sissy. <laughs> <laughs> And so Sissy Austin called me on the phone. Now, Sissy Austin's father-in-law supported me in the Senate race. He was a fine man. And Sissy Austin's husband did not support me in the Senate race. He was a man. <laughs> Sissy came on the line and she says, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. What am I doing? I, I'm sitting here at my desk. No, what are you doing with that bill? I said, Sissy, there are 3,000 bills up here. Which bill are you talking about? That one that makes the school board meet in open session, she said. She was, she was just breathless. She was so angry. And I said, Sissy, you mean you all don't? She said, no, we don't meet in open session. How in the world do you think we can conduct the business of Jacksonville Independent School District if we have to do it in the open? <laughs> I said, well, I'll tell you what, Sissy, you're fixing to learn. <laughs> Besides me holding on to Laura's coattail trying to keep up, 
Alicia is holding on to my coattails trying to keep up with both of us. She has been a great part of this team. And Mike, I want to tell you, thank you for Donis Baggett. Thank you for Donis Baggett. Laura and Alicia both, I know, will agree with me that Donis Baggett has been a major, major addition to our team for the passage of First Amendment legislation. Ladies and gentlemen, Governor, Governor, Representative, Representative Hunter, who isn't here. By the way, Todd Hunter, Todd Hunter from Corpus Christi, Texas, is our champion. He has carried all of this legislation, except the first time when the reporter's privilege didn't pass. He has carried every one of the rest of them. And you know, <clears throat> even though I was a green as grass boy from Jasper, I learned that the chairman of the House Calendars Committee was rarely ever told no. And, and Todd Hunter was never told no. Laura and Kelly and all of my friends had come to see this honor. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not supposed to be up here right now, um, but I had to point out a couple of things. Did y'all hear? I was so green I couldn't burn. <laughs> taking, uh, taking the hair off of a feral hog. Okay, this is what I'm talking about with the East Texasisms. And, and I learned now that most women from East Texas are named Sissy. But in addition to my um, crash course in East Texasisms, Lieutenant Governor Bill Hobby would like to come up and share some of his stories with us about East Texas as well. While he's approaching, I did want to mention one thing as well. We have yellow roses on the table here today. Those yellow roses are in honor of Don's beautiful wife, Linda Adams, who couldn't be with us here today, but we are all thinking of her and wishing her well. Lieutenant Governor Hobby. Now, Don, we all know you believe in open meetings and open records and all that. Uh, you believe in equal time, don't you? <laughs> As Laura said in her introduction, one year Don was my campaign manager. That year, my Republican opponent uh, <clears throat> was a big time George Strait, big, big time Roman Catholic from Houston. Okay. So I made a, I cut a television commercial at a commercial studio here in Austin. And after the shoot, the director came over and told me, uh, said, you know, your opponent was in here last week and, and he made a, uh, he made a commercial said it was a commercial, it, it showed what a big Roman Catholic he was. It showed the Pope blessing him as a child and so forth, and okay. So next time I saw Don, I told him that, okay. It was about, about two years after that campaign, somebody somewhere, I don't even remember who it was, told me, he says, hey, that's a pretty cute stunt you pulled on Strake. And I said, oh, what was that? Uh, 
getting those commercials that he meant to run in South Texas to run in East Texas. <laughs> well, that was the first I'd heard. I, I, I didn't. It was the first I'd heard of that. But as soon as soon as I heard that story, mm -hmm, that's Adams. That, <laughs> and the uh, next time I saw him, I told Don, I said, you Don, I heard this funny thing the other day. Uh, you know anything about that? And Don went into his all shucks governor routine. <laughs> I got some more Adam stories, but that's enough for today. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Katherine Robb, and it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, my good friend and sometimes partner in crime, Mark Updegrove. Since October 2009, Mark has served as the director of the LBJ Presidential Library. Mark is an author and historian and has authored four books. And the first two were called Second Acts, Presidential Lives and Legacies After the White House. The second, was baptism by fire, eight presidents who took office during times of crisis. Now, Mark is a presidential historian, as I said. And, you may, and if you've read these first two books, though, uh, you will notice there's a glaring omission in them. Uh, Mark then came to the LBJ Presidential Library and realized that glaring omission. And he then wrote Indomitable Will, LBJ in the Presidency, and dest uh, which, uh, as you might imagine, is about the subject of the library. Uh, he also, since then, has written Destiny of Democracy, the Civil Rights Summit at the LBJ Presidential Library. On any Sunday morning, you might have two opportunities to see Mark, if you're lucky. In addition to working as an analyst for ABC News on matters relating to the presidency, he is a contributor to CBS Sunday Morning. And if you're like me, you might be sitting on your couch on a Sunday morning, reading the paper, drinking your cup of coffee, pulling out the parade section, uh, you might flip through the parade section and read an article and say, well, that was pretty, pretty interesting, and then look at the back and realize that it's written by Mark, as I did last week, and I went, huh, I'll have to ask him about that. Um, he's also written for American Heritage, The Nation, National Geographic, Politico, Texas Monthly, The Daily Beast, and Time. Prior to coming to the LBJ Library, Mark spent much of his career in magazine publishing, including serving as managing or manager of Time Magazine in Los Angeles, president of Time Canada, and US publisher of Newsweek in New York. During his tenure at the LBJ Library, the library has undergone an $11 million renovation of its core museum exhibits uh, around President Johnson and his administration. And if I can give a little pitch, if you haven't been to see it, you should go see it. It's great. I'm a little biased, um, but it really is very good. And they use, one of the uh, benefits of the renovation was using all of the telephone tapes. So you really get a really interesting insight into, uh, into that presidency and into that, those times. Um, so apologize for the pitch. Um, in addition, since he took over the directorship of the library, he's hosted numerous programs expanding the library's reach, uh, including most recently, the, or recently, I should say, the Civil Rights Summit at the library to mark the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That was last year, and we had uh, four presidents, the sitting president and three former presidents there. Uh, just yesterday, Mark hosted a conference at the library with CIA Director John Brennan and Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, and they released the presidential daily briefings from the 1960s. 
Now, the timing of that seems uh, really uh, good for uh, Mark's talk today, and I asked him earlier, and I said, you know, it seems a little suspicious. I'm wondering if maybe you did that so you'd have something to talk about today, and he, he says it's not true. Uh, Mark can do a lot of things. I'm not sure he could actually uh, micromanage the CIA quite that well, but I guess he'll probably come tell us about that. So, Mark, up to you. Governor White, uh, Governor Hobby, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for having me here. And, and Catherine, thank you for that generous introduction, my, my partner in crime. Uh, thank you, moreover, for your leadership in this community and for upholding the legacies of your grandfather and your grandmother. I want to congratulate the Gavel Award winners as well as Senator Adams. Senator Adams, I agree with Laura. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I got to tell you, these witticisms in Texas, they've always got me green, uh, so green uh, uh, that I couldn't burn. I, I, that's, that's fantastic. I, I, I grew up hearing this stuff, seeing it on TV. I thought, this is fabulous. And I've, I've heard my friend Governor White say things like that. I thought, well, how, how can I, I'd love to be able to have those things trickle off my tongue. And then I realized how you get them. And, and it's, this relates to a story about Lyndon Johnson. And I heard about a story uh, about him when he was a senator. And he was about to go on a re-election uh, trip to, to the Lone Star State here. And he was reading a draft speech by his speechmakers. And uh, he called them into his office. And he's reading this, this first draft of a stump speech that they had drawn up for him. And he stumbles on a, a passage from Plato. And he says, Plato? Plato, let me get this straight. I'm going home to talk to just plain Texans, just plain folks, and you've got me quoting Plato? He said, keep the quote, but start it with, my daddy always used to say. <laughs> so I think I know where these things come from. Uh, just as there are great stories about Lyndon Johnson, there are great stories from Lyndon Johnson, and he frequently talked about his hometown of Johnson City, Texas. And one story he liked to tell was about a, an old man in town who was having trouble with his hearing. And he goes to his doctor to talk about it. And he says, Doc, I've been having trouble with my hearing. And the doctor says, well, you know, uh, how much are you drinking these days? Old Cooch says, well, I'm, I'm drinking about a pint a day. The doctor says, well, that's not going to do. You know, if you want to improve your hearing, you've got to quit your drinking. He says, you think you can do that? Well, he said, well, I'll try. He said, all right, well, you come back in six weeks, and then we'll talk about your hearing. Guy goes, by. six weeks go along, comes back. The doctor said, doc, I'm still having trouble with my hearing. The doctor says, well, did, did, did you quit your drinking? He said, no, I didn't do that. The doctor says, well, how, how can I help you if you don't follow my prescription? I told you six weeks ago to quit your drinking. Now, why didn't you do it? He said, well, Doc, I, I thought about it, and I, I thought, well, uh, I liked what I was drinking better than what I was hearing. <laughs> one of the things we've always heard about Lyndon Johnson, and one of the things that is indeed very true, is his remarkable ability to get things done. And 2015 is the 50th anniversary of 1965, which saw a, a, a spate of legislation passed by LBJ. Uh, and it was really LBJ at his legislative peak. So here are the laws that LBJ passed in one year, 50 years ago. The Voting Rights Act, the most important civil rights act on the books. The Immigration Act, the most sweeping immigration reform ever passed by Congress. Medicare and Medicaid. The creation of the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts, the creation of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, elementary and secondary education, higher education, the Highway Beautification Act, the Clean Air Act, and the implementation of Head Start. That is one single year. I've had the great good fortune in my career to, to know presidents. And I can, can tell you there's not a single one that I've known who wouldn't give his eye teeth for one or two of those pieces of legislation, let alone the full panoply 
of what LBJ passed during the course of his presidency. But LBJ also knew the ephemeral nature of political power. He said after his landslide election in 1964, when a man is first elected to the presidency, he's a giraffe. A year later, he's a worm. The following year, in 1966, Johnson wanted to pass a Fair Housing Act, which would have been a, represented the triumvirate of civil rights acts that Johnson was to sign. The Civil Rights Act, which broke the back of Jim Crow, the Voting Rights Act, which I just mentioned, and the Fair Housing Act. But in 1966, John, Johnson's dominant control of Congress had weakened and he didn't submit the bill knowing it would likely fail. However, and this is astounding, 207 or 56 percent of the 371 proposals that Johnson submitted to Congress were approved. For Johnson, it was considered a slump. Today we might call it a miracle. But by LBJ's standards, he was starting to become a worm. One of the, back, the bills, however, that did pass in 1966 was FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. A Democratic con uh, congressman from Sacramento, California, the late John Moss, was the real hero of the FOIA story. <clears throat> Supported by extensive press coverage and active lobbying by newspaper editors, Moss led hearings beginning in 1955 that documented and denounced excessive government secrecy. But as long as Dwight D. Eisenhower was president, Moss could not find Republican co-sponsors for his proposed legislation until the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Politics being what it is, Republicans became more interested in FOIA when John F. Kennedy became president, and especially after LBJ's landslide election in 1964. A young, ambitious Republican congressman from Illinois named Donald Rumsfeld, was assigned to Moss's subcommittee. And Rumsfeld signed up as a co-sponsor of FOIA. His reason, though, differed slightly from Moss's. Rumsfeld fought for the law by denouncing Johnson's administration's continuing tendency toward managed news and suppression of public information that people are and should be entitled to. Still, the bill was supported by several government agencies, including the Department of Justice and by many of Johnson's aides themselves, including Press Secretary Bill Moyers. The bill passed the House by a vote of 307 to 0. After Congress adjourned, Johnson retreated to the LBJ ranch, faced with two options around the bill, sign it or sign a pocket veto. A June 24th memo to Johnson stated that Congressman Moss was urging a public signing and a speech. At the bottom of the memo, Johnson wrote in very large letters, no ceremony. In fact, he was still on the fence about the signing. According to Bill Moyers, last minute phone calls from newspaper editors in favor of the bill persuaded Johnson to sign it. He did so at the LBJ ranch on July 4th, symbolically, in 1966, but with no fanfare. He even uncharacteristically gave his photographer the day off, so we have no record of the signing at all except for Johnson's signature on the bill, which he did in his office at the ranch. According to Bill Moyers, uh, the, the uh, press was briefed in San Antonio not knowing that the bill would be signed. But in the press release, Johnson stated, a democracy works best when the people have all the information that the security of the nation permits. No one should be able to pull curtains of secrecy around decisions which can be revealed without injury to the public interest. At the same time, he clearly stated exceptions to federal transparency, further stating, the welfare of the nation and the rights of individuals may require that some documents may not be made public. As long as threats to peace exist, for example, there must be military secrets. Fairness to individuals 
also requires that information accumulated in personnel files be protected from disclosure. Officials within the government must be able to communicate with one another fully and, frankly, without publicity. They cannot operate effectively if required to disclose information prematurely or to make public investigative files and internal instructions that guide them in arriving at their decision. Less than 10 years later, in 1974, amendments to, the, to, to FOIA were passed which gave it greater potency, a direct result of the unraveling of the Watergate scandal. There's no doubt that LBJ was ambivalent about FOIA, which he likely construed as a personal indictment. Yet he insisted on openness and transparency when it came to the records of his presidency. He wanted all of the records of his administration stored at the LBJ Presidential Library open to the public as soon as possible. In 1971, at Johnson's request, then LBJ Library Director Harry Middleton worked with former National Security Advisor Walt Rostow to prepare a rationale that Johnson could present to President Nixon that would pers persuade him to expedite declassified information on foreign policy from Johnson's administration, including documents concerning the Vietnam War. Johnson, unfortunately, died before he was to meet with Nixon. At the dedication of the LBJ Library, on the other hand, in, in May of 1972, Nixon was president. At that time, and I believe that Governor Hobby was at that occasion, LBJ said, it's all here, a story of our time with the bark off. Today, as the library enjoys a reputation of leadership and declassification and openness, we appreciate Johnson's words and we live by them. Most of you, I think, probably have had a chance to hear those famous telephone tapes from Lyndon Johnson. There are 643 hours of them at the LBJ Presidential Library. And if you go through the new exhibit, which Catherine just mentioned, you can see handsets liberally sprinkled around the exhibit and can pick up that phone and hear LBJ doing the business of his presidency in the context of that exhibit. You can hear his remarkable effectiveness. And I, I can happily report that LBJ wanted those phone conversations sealed for 50 years, but was overruled posthumously by Lady Bird Johnson, the very courageous grandmother of Catherine Robb, deemed, uh, along with Harry Middleton, that these were invaluable to the public and they should be revealed as soon as possible. And so we removed that 50-year restriction from the tapes and began processing them in the 1990s and early into the millennium. And they provide a window into LBJ's administration that is absolutely invaluable. And so do the 55 million documents that we continue to process at the LBJ Presidential Library. Just 24 hours ago, as Catherine mentioned, the CIA released 19,000 pages of presidential daily briefs given to both President Kennedy and President Johnson, all formally classified. They chose the LBJ Presidential Library to make the announcement, not only because most of the records related to the president whose name is on the building, but also because Johnson was such a strong advocate of openness. At 1 p.m. yesterday, CIA Director John Brennan, an alumnus of the University of Texas, Hook'em Horns, spoke at the library about the importance of intelligence to presidential decision making. As he spoke, those 19,000 documents were made available to the public on the CIA's and the LBJ Library's websites. I think Lyndon Johnson would have been very proud. I'll close with a story about LBJ, which perfectly captures his sentiments about open records. It comes from uh, Harry Middleton, who I mentioned earlier. Harry was the founding director of the LBJ Library, 93 years old, still with us today, often looks over my shoulder, as he should. One of his favorite tales was about uh, LBJ, and it sparked, was sparked by his uh, hesitation to open certain papers before a symposium at the library. 
Harry was worried that LBJ might be embarrassed or compromised by the release of these papers. And LBJ knew that Harry would be concerned. Uh, and, and Harry said, Mr. President, we can hold these back. And LBJ replied saying, Harry, good men have been trying to protect my reputation for 40 years and not a damn one has succeeded. <laughs> what the hell makes you think you can? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you, uh, to Senator Adams, for your remarks. Um, I think that uh, certainly everything that we've seen today, uh, all of us who uh, are fighting for open government uh, know that it can often be discouraging, uh, whether it's at the local level, at the state level, or even at the federal level. Um, but I think that when we look at some of what our award winners today have accomplished, and certainly uh, some of the things that Senator Adams and his colleagues have done on the behalf of open government, uh, there are lots of reasons to be encouraged. And uh, I hope I'm, I'm not uh, uh, trying to paraphrase anything for Senator Adams, but I would say that uh, rather than getting discouraged, we should just get even. So. Um, <laughs> However, we're not done. Uh, we still have a couple of sessions uh, this afternoon down on the first floor, and everyone is, is welcome. We look forward to having you there. And uh, don't forget as well that we have a silent auction in the, that's uh, going on in the back of our meeting room on the first floor. And uh, bidding on the items that are there, we have some photographs, we have some getaways. Uh, and the bidding will end at 2.15, so if you're interested, make sure you get your bids in, and thank you all again for being with us. Thank you.